Okay, hello. Uh, thank you for coming or watching the recording. Um, I am recording, right? right so. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see the little thing. All right. Um, okay, I guess um, before I start, I should ask if there's any questions about the syllabus or anything like that. Okay. Um, so, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, 1703 to 1758. Um, so, uh, Jonathan Edwards is, well, obviously pre-American in the sense of, uh, pre-United States, since he died, he died in 1758. Uh, but in some other sense of American, I guess you could say he was one of the first important American philosophers, that is, European American philosophers. Um, um, people don't read him very much these days, I guess, at least in philosophy departments. Um, um, I hadn't read anything before him until I started trying to get ready to teach this course, uh, but I actually found out he's really interesting. Um, I kind of had that impression before from certain other people who mentioned him. Um, in any case, if you've heard of him at all, you've probably heard of him because of this, uh, his most famous work is this kind of fire and brimstone, kind of philosophical version of fire and brimstone, but still a kind of fire and brimstone uh, sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Um, but he also wrote plenty of stuff like uh, what I assigned for this course, which um, I mean, uh, it's theistic for sure, but it's, you know, he talks about God quite often, but in a philosophical way, right? I mean, he mostly sounds more like Leibniz uh, than like Billy Graham. Um, and uh, um, And he's closely engaged with various Enlightenment philosophers uh, such as Hume and Hutchinson. Um, so, I mean, to say he was a Puritan uh, preacher is true, but would give a little bit of a misleading impression of him. Um, he also sounds more like Leibniz than most of the people we're going to read later in this course do. Uh, more like Leibniz or Locke or Descartes. Um, and so like in talking about him, I'm going to be spending time talking about his definitions and his arguments and stuff like that. As we'll see right away when we get to Emerson, it's not so easy to do that with some of the later people. Um, but I think it is the right way to talk about him. Um, um, you don't know too much about his biography. Uh, I think what I do know mostly comes from Wikipedia, so you can read it yourself. But um, as I said, I think last time, I'm not really a historian. Uh, I start off reading, like trying to understand what a philosopher is saying. And then usually I kind of like get dragged gradually into knowing more and more about what other things were actually going on then or what they did during their life or things like that. 
Um, so, uh, you know, but I can say a few things about Edwards. Um, he was born in Connecticut and um, his parents and at least some of his grandparents, maybe all his grandparents were also born in the colonies. So he's, you know, uh, again, although not American in the sense of being a citizen of the United States of America, he's an American colonist. He's not really English. Um, um, he attended Yale at a young age, and while he was there, apparently he was uh, very struck with Locke's work, I guess similar to the way Locke himself was very struck with Descartes in Oxford years earlier. Um, um, after he finished his education, he became the pastor of a Congregationalist church uh, his his father's Congregationalist Church. Now, I mean, I guess I'm not going to go into the differences in different church polities here. I say a little bit about that in 144, but um, apparently he was actually was more sympathetic to Presbyterianism than he was to Congregationalism, but uh, it was his, you know, his father's church. So that's where he ended up, or actually grandfather's, I guess, grandfather's church. Um, and, uh, after that in 1751, now I'm not sure exactly when he wrote the, the discourse concerning the nature of true virtue. It wasn't published until after his death. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly which year he wrote it. But in any case, in 1751, he became pastor of a church of the church in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and a missionary to the Housatonic Indians, who were a, ba a band of Mohicans. Um, so this was something, this was a widespread institution that various bands of Indians would have missionaries appointed to them. We'll see uh, when some of our reading for next time, some of the, or for tomorrow, <laughs> some of the problems that came up because of that. Um, but uh, um, the Wikipedia article says, and this is taken, this part of the article, however, was just taken from an older edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, 1911 edition. So it says, to the Indians, he preached through an interpreter and their interests he boldly and successfully defended by attacking the whites who were using their official positions among them to increase their private fortunes. So uh, it doesn't give any sources for that. I asked a friend of mine who's a Puritanist, um, she's in the English department at Barnard, if uh, she could point me on to like anything that would confirm this and she did send the the names of a bunch of articles but i never got around to reading them so i can't tell you for sure what this defense of the indians amounted to um, um but um at least according to someone who liked him <laughs> he was he was a defender of the interests of the indians um and in 1758, he became the president of Princeton University. So that's why, if you notice in our um, in the PDF I uploaded, it's you know um, from the collected works of President Edwards, president of Princeton University. But he wasn't president of Princeton University very long. He died from getting a smallpox inoculation, which I guess were kind of risky in those days. Um, and the only other interesting thing I wanted to mention about his biography was that his daughter, Esther Edwards, married Aaron Burr Sr., who was the grandfather of the famous Aaron Burr, like from Hamilton, if you've seen that. Um, that Aaron Burr was 
uh, although this does not come out in the musical Hamilton, that Aaron Burr was a feminist and an abolitionist. Um, but uh, I don't think we can say the same thing about his. Sorry, so Edwards was the grandfather, not Aaron Burr Sr. was the father of the famous Aaron Burr. So Edwards was his maternal grandfather. Um, I don't think we can conclude anything in particular about him. Um, okay. Um, are there any questions about any of that? If there are, I probably can't answer them, <laughs> but I could try. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to go on to talking about what he says in this book. Oh, I guess I should mention one other thing, which is that um, as far as I know, he was not an important influence on any of the people we'll be reading later in the course. I don't even know uh, if any of them read him. I I kind of suppose that Emerson must have. But uh, again, that's something that that's a question that could be answered. Emerson has lots of journals and everything. So I'm sure someone knows, but I, I don't know. Um, most of the other pro others probably didn't. But nevertheless, he introduces themes that are going to come up um, uh, over and over throughout the course. And um, Presumably, that's because these are themes that are somehow connected to the American situation, even before independence. So even before the Declaration of Independence, this type of issue about particularity and universality is already coming up. Um, and therefore, they're going to continue through later American philosophers, even if they haven't necessarily read each other. Um, why? Would this come up even before independence? So, I mean, this is not a complete answer and I don't have a complete answer, but we will see um, Viola Cordova towards the end of the course say something like, um, Euro-Americans aren't from here. And then she says something like, they're not from anywhere. <laughs> Right, they're not from around here, but they're not from anywhere else either. Um, so uh, even without declaring independence, there's already a strangeness to being a uh, Yankee, right? <laughs> to being uh, in, a native of New England, but not what we call a Native American that is not indigenous. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if that's a good explanation or not. I, I know it's not a complete explanation because um, there's a lot of other places like that, like Australia or whatever. And well, as far as they know, they have not produced the same kind of thought. I guess Canada really has to some extent. So well, we'll talk about that when we get to it. Um, Okay, and so the big theme like this is the one I talked about last time about particularity. And it first comes up in this book because Edwards makes a distinction between particular and general beauty. This is kind of a mismatch general should go with special, right? Like genus, species, particular should go with universal, but oh well, whatever. Um, this is the way he draws the distinction. Um, so what does he mean by beauty? Well, so there's something like a definition of this in chapter one. And it's in page 13 in your text. Now I have a different printed edition here. Um, and um, boy, actually maybe I should use, 
I did print out the same edition you have. Hold on one second. No, oh, except I didn't mark the passages in that. No, I'm going to use this one, but I'll tell you what page it is in yours. So now, let's see if this works. No, 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 no. Yes. Ross here. It's on page 13 in your text, it's on page 10 in mine. I mean, he doesn't give this officially as a definition of beauty, but it seems to be equivalent in this passage. The beauty of the being in whom it is, an excellency that renders him worthy of esteem, complacence, and the general goodwill. Right, so a beauty is an excellency. Um, excellency is potentially another translation of the same Greek word arete, which is translated as virtue. Um, but uh, here, I guess he's using it more broadly than he's using virtue. And he's saying, um, that the beauty of something is an excellency that renders it worthy of esteem, complacence, and greater goodwill. Now, I think um, greater goodwill is probably specific to the context here, because in the context, he's talking about the type of beauty that deserves benevolence, right, that deserves love. Um, but the rest of it, an excellency that renders worthy of esteem and complacence seems to be a, uh, like what he means by beauty in general. So esteem, I guess, has to do with setting a value on something. And complacence, he in other places makes equivalent to like delighting in where delighting in means something, I guess, like taking pleasure in just the fact that something is the way it is. Right, as opposed to, for example, uh, deriving a pleasant sensation from something, that's not complacence, that's not delighting in it. Um, that's, you know, you're taking pleasure because of what it does to you, but complacence means taking pleasure because something is the way it is. So, um, so I think this definition means beauty is a kind of quality or character that something has such that we value it and we're pleased that it is that way. Okay, so that's what beauty in general is. And then what's this distinction between particular and general beauty? So I'm going to read this too. Oops. This is on page eight in your edition. It's page two in mine. By a particular beauty, I mean that by which a thing appears beautiful when considered only with regard to its connection with and tendency to some particular things within a limited and as it were a private sphere. And a general beauty, is that by which a thing appears beautiful when viewed most perfectly, comprehensively, and universally with regard to all its tendencies and its connections with everything to which it stands related. And then, this is important, that's why I put a box around it. 
The former may be without and against the latter. Right, so when you consider whether something is beautiful or not, you, um, you know, you're asking, does it have a quality or a character that causes me to value it and be pleased that it is the way it is? Um, but um, when you ask that question, you can be considering everything about it and it's relate all its relations to everything, or you can be ignoring some of its relations to some things. You can be considering it only in a particular context. Um, and uh, obviously you can reach different decisions depending on whether you leave certain things out of account or not. So um, something can have particular beauty, um, but lack general beauty because it only seemed pleasing and valuable because you were ignoring certain things about it. Now, I mean, I'm saying all of this on a very abstract level as, as is Edwards at this point, right? Because we haven't asked what kind of beauty this is yet without saying, even with just this very vague characterization of it's some kind of character that uh, we value and are pleased with, um, we can already see that um, there's in general, in general, uh, um, that there always can be an opposition between the verdict we reach on something's beauty from a general point of view versus the verdict we would reach from a partic particular point of view. And I guess you have to add one more thing, which is the general point of view is the right one. Ray, like Edwards in that quote said, um, a general beauty is that by which a thing appears beautiful when viewed most perfectly, right? So that is to view it, um, to judge about its particular beauty, you deliberately ignore certain things, you're leaving them out, but they're still there, <laughs> right? So you're, you're not reaching the right decision. If the two are in conflict, it's the general beauty is the, is the right one. That's the way Edwards is thinking about this anyway. Now, all of this is relevant, of course, because um, when Edwards defines virtue, which is what the book is about, the nature of true virtue, he, the first thing he says about it is that virtue is some kind of beauty or excellency. Um, And then he further specifies that. So this is on page seven in your edition, on page one in mine. But virtue is the beauty of those qualities and acts of the mind that are of a moral nature. That is, such as are attended with desert or worthiness of, of praise or blame. And he goes on to say, you know, what this means is that uh, what we're interested in here is the beauty that um, a rational being has. Um, um, thanks to those faculties or powers that we consider when we attach praise or blame. And he says a general name for those would be the heart, right? So virtue is... beauty of the heart. Now, I mean, he doesn't really give an argument for that last part, 
Um, nor am I sure why he says the heart rather than, for example, the will, right? If this were Kant, he would say, you know, even though Kant wouldn't, well, would Kant agree with this definition? That's too complicated to answer. Um, but anyway, if this were Kant, he would say he would say beauty of the will. Um, but uh, but the heart is supposed to include that and perhaps some other kind of relevant faculties. Um, so uh, so like I said, he doesn't argue for that part of the definition really. Um, but uh, um, Um, but I think he takes for granted that this is what we usually mean by virtue. I mean, uh, that's certainly true that like this is what we mean by virtue in ethics, right? Because we're interested in not what quality or character could be called good about us in general, but what kind um, does praise and blame attach to? What kind deserves reward and punishment would be another uh, question. And Edwards is going to try to prove that uh, a virtuous being will want to reward virtuous other virtuous beings um, in, in particular. Therefore, God will want to reward virtuous beings. So it is also the kind of excellency that will get you reward. Um, so. Uh, that's the kind we care about when we're talking about ethics. One or the other of those in some combination. Um, so therefore the definition of virtue, this is still on page seven in yours. Um, bottom of page seven. <clears throat> Virtue is the beauty of the qualities and exercises of the heart or those actions which proceed from them. Right, so virtue is the excellence or uh, beauty of these faculties, like base, mostly the will uh, that um, um, by virtue of which we deserve praise or blame. Um, and secondarily, I think is what he means, also the actions that proceed from them, right? So when you call something a virtuous action, you mean that it's the type of action that proceeds from the beauty of the heart. Um, so why am I emphasizing that part? Like in what sense actions are called virtuous versus in what sense the, um, um, the nature of our will or heart is called virtuous, that, that the action is virtuous um, in a secondary sense as kind of a sign or a possible sign of the virtuousness of the heart or the will. Um, because, uh, you know, what this means is that uh, in Edwards, just as a little bit later in Kant, right? So Kant's mature works are written in the 1780s. Kant was already around at, at this time, but he had, was not close to writing the philosophy he's now known for. Um, so uh, like just as a little bit later in Kant, the, um, 
virtue of an action is going to depend on the principle from which it was done. And this is important because Edwards, like Kant, thinks there are lots of motives other than virtue, um, which incline us to the kinds of action that true virtue demands, right? So um, there's all kinds of actions that would be virtuous if done from a virtuous principle, but we can be motivated to do those same things and even like systematically motivated to do those same things from some other principle. And in that case, it's not true virtue. Okay, so um, given that definition of virtue and this thing about particular versus general beauty, we learn automatically, therefore, there's such thing as particular versus general virtue. Um, and particular virtue may be without and against general virtue. Right, so an action may look virtuous when you ignore some of the relations I stand in. Well, I guess I sh again, I shouldn't fin I shouldn't focus on the action first. The, a principle of my heart, a motive for action, may look beautiful when you ignore some of the relations I stand in. And so when you ignore that, you may say, oh, beauty of the heart, that's virtuous. But when you bring back in the consideration, the universal consideration of everything, and that's when you're going to reach the true judgment, then um, you may say, oh, no, now from this point of view, that doesn't look like virtue. So particular virtue can be without and against true virtue. And that's why the title of the book is Dissertation Concerning the Nature of True Virtue, right? Because a big part of the book consists of um, distinguishing between true virtue and other things that are kind of like virtue the main one being particular virtue, something that would be virtuous if um, you left certain things out of account. Biggest example is self-love. It's gonna, well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I didn't say what the beauty of the heart is yet, but it's going to turn out that self-love is the same as virtue as long as you ignore everyone except me when you consider when you right when you're trying to reach your decision. So it's very, very particular virtue. Um, okay, so um so true ven general virtue is some kind of quality or character of the heart that's valuable and intrinsically pleasing. What is it? So in a move that, uh, again, in some ways anticipates Kant, uh, Edwards, and you know, okay, I'm not going to keep comparing him to Kant over and over. Uh, we're not reading Kant in this course, and uh, you know, but uh, um, but I am going to compare him one or two more times. And um, it's not surprising that there would be similarities between them. I mean, they have just both been reading Hume, for one thing, right? So, uh, um, not only that, Kant was raised by pietists in Germany, and um, they actually apparently had some interest in Edwards. Now, I don't think that means Kant read this book. As far as I can tell, this book wasn't translated into German. I very much doubt he read it. 
um but they they were both reading hume and they were both in similar like radical protestant milieus milieus every pronounce that when they were when they were reading it okay so um um right so what i was going to say is what in some ways anticipates kant is that he derives the answer from the generality or universality itself Right. What could be the quality that um, when you take everything into account would be valuable or pleasing? And he says, um, so this is on page nine in your text. I'm sorry, this is I'm trying a different way of doing this, and it turns out to be confusing. Um, and oh, okay. So, um, Tina Tran says in the chat, I feel like Kant and Edwards are similar because Kant is an uncritical follower of Leibniz. <laughs> Well, uh, I mean, Kant is a critical follower of Leibniz, hence the title of the Critique of Pure Reason. It's critical, right? But anyway, Kant is an uncritical follower of Leibniz, and Edwards's philosophy with nature and God is like Leibniz's philosophy on substance. Um, So, I mean, Kant's philosophy on this point kind of um, the Kant's moral philosophy, I guess I would put it something like this, like Kant responds to Hume and Kant respects Hume very highly. So uh, Kant it's a serious response to Hume. Kant responds to Hume using a kind of combination of Leibniz and Rousseau. Um, it's by no means straight Leibniz. Uh, um, although it's by no means straight Rousseau either. <laughs> um, and it's both of them thinking, while thinking about what Hume says in the second inquiry. Um, now, how much of that, I mean, I, I don't notice anything in this text that's specifically Leibnizian. I think, uh, the places it sounds similar to Leibniz are just because of general philosophical tradition in the background of, of everyone, but I could be wrong about that. Um, yeah, it's worth thinking about further. I don't know. Um, so we could certainly have read Leibniz, although I'm going to assume he knew French. He certainly could have read the new essays. The monodology, of course, wasn't published for a long time after Leibniz's death, but uh, um, he could have read the Theodicy and the new essays. Yeah, there's no reason to suppose there's no influence of Leibniz on him, but I, I just haven't seen anything like that specifically. Um, um, and as I said, there's also the fact that that he and Kant, I mean, this is important in Kant's moral philosophy. You see it more when you get, for obvious reasons, to the religion book, religion within the bounds of reason alone. But uh, but I think it's operating throughout is that, you know, another thing he's trying to reinterpret is the um, like radical Protestant doctrines he was brought up on. Yeah, uh, okay, that's all I can say. <laughs> that's all that I can say and probably more than I should have said about that. But um, all right, so anyway, back to this. 
this is an, this is his argument to to establish what beauty of the heart is. Beauty does not consist in discord and dissent. See, this is related to Kant's argument about contradiction in the will. It's not the same argument, but it's related to it somehow. Beauty does not consist in discord and dissent, but in consent and agreement. And if every intelligent being is some way related to being in general. Now, I mean, he says right away around here that by being in general, he means intelligent being in general. See, I mean, this is a Leibnizian point, maybe. The kingdom of grace versus the kingdom of nature. But I don't know if that's really so specific to Leibniz. Anyway, um, he means uh, is in some way related to intelligent being in general, rational being. Right. So and if every intelligent being is some way related to being in general and is a part of the universal system of existence and so stands in connection with the whole, what can its general and true, true beauty be but its union and consent with the great whole? Right. So like the thing that constitutes true beauty has to be a kind of um, characteristic of my will that aligns it with all other rational beings. And what could that be? Now, so here is where it's not like Kant and it's probably in some ways more like Locke or, well, I don't know. But anyway, um, you know, what could that be? Well, it must be that um, I wish the good of all rational beings as such. Um, in that way, my will will be in agreement with the whole. Now, I mean, where we get the premise that of the argument. So the premise was beauty does not consist in discord and dissent, but in consent and agreement. And if you plug in the definition of beauty that I read before, that would mean something like discord and dissent is not valuable and pleasing, but rather um, um, consent and agreement. Consent here, by the way, I think Um, so this is going to come up in other authors too. Consent, uh, well, I guess you could put it this way. It means more like what we usually mean by consensus. So, right. Um, right, it, uh, consent with all rational beings means like, in other words, that's why it's a synonym with, for agreement or, or roughly the same thing as agreement. It means that, uh, you know, having the same sentiment as all rational beings. Okay, so um, so we're so why how do we know that beauty does not consist in discord and dissent, but in consent and agreement? Um, you know, he doesn't say, but I guess the idea is that. Um, What we esteem and delight in is going to be something that it, that agrees with us, right? We're not going to esteem and delight in what discords with us and what dissents from us. You could definitely question that, right? Like Nietzsche would definitely question that. <laughs> but um, but on the surface, it seems plausible. And then you'd say, and here us means all rational beings, you know? So uh, like we want something that agrees with us or maybe I could say with no one in particular, we just want something that's agreeable. 
Um, so anyway, whether that's the argument for the premise or not, the conclusion that he draws from it is that um, true virtue is universal benevolence, wishing the good to all beings. And again, with being qualified to mean intelligent being. Um, presumably because those other non-intelligent beings don't have what we call the heart. So there's nothing to agree with, right? I mean, that's clear. Well, not clear. Nothing's clear, right? But I mean, I just brought up Leibniz, but um, but it seems clear in the case of inanimate things, right? The Leibniz may think that there's an infinite number of monads in them, you know, but but for the most part, we think that like this pen doesn't have the faculties that could deserve praise, praise and blame or whatever, right? So there's no way that I that I can have, this is another word he uses for this sometimes, cordial union, right? Cordial, this part means heart. <laughs> a cordial union is a union of hearts. So there's no way I can have a cordial union with this pen because it doesn't have a heart. It's less clear if you say that about, let's say my cat, who usually she pays careful attention to lectures when I do them at home, but now she seems to be asleep. <laughs> anyway, um, to my cat, Lily, I mean, you might think she does have a will and, you know, uh, um, but in any case, um, um, he thinks it's clear that, that non-human animals, at, at least the ones we know of, that we take not to be intelligent or that he takes not to be intelligent, don't have a heart to agree with. Where again, like heart means will. So it's a rational faculty. Um, right, so, um, so the conclusion is that virtue is absolute benevolence. Now, um, um, This autumn, this, you know, right away raises the question. What is it? So benevolence means that you, to all intelligent beings, means that you wish their good to them, right? You, uh, you know, you, you, you want, um, you want them to have what's good for them. But what is that? <laughs> Um, so, um, if we said, um, if we said benevolence means desiring pleasure for all intelligent beings, then that would make Edwards into a utilitarian. A weird utilitarian because most utilitarians don't include God in their calculus, <laughs> right? um, which is in effect what he complains about, right? I mean, the people we call utilitarians uh, pretty sure we're not born yet. When was Bentham born? No, actually that must not be true. He must have been alive but he hadn't written his utilitarian philosophy yet. So, I mean, um, you know, but he criticizes people like Locke and Hume who, who uh, um, who have a similar concept of public utility. Um, 
So, well, and I say criticize, or yeah, I mean, he criticizes them for doing this calculation over all human beings or over all finite rational beings and leaving God out, whereas God is infinitely more important. <laughs> um, so, uh, which is, you know, um, leads to some weird complications. I think in the end, it kind of cancels out though, of like what they do in quantum field theory. It turns out that that infinite, you know, because God doesn't actually need anything from us. He he and he takes that on as an objection right away and tries to explain why we can still wish the good for God even though he doesn't need our wishes. <laughs> um, but it turn it ends up that benevolence is always going to be exercised in doing good for for finite rational beings, right? That's that's the kind of action it's going to lead to. So anyway, be that as it may, um, what I was I'm interrupting myself. What I was starting to say was if benevolence meant seeking pleasure for all rational beings, then uh, Edwards would be a utilitarian. Um, in fact, what he says, um, this I believe was not in the unsigned reading, but it's on page 25 um, in both your book and mine. Um, Switch this. Come on. So far as a virtuous mind exercises true virtue in benevolence to created beings, it chiefly seeks the good of the creature, consisting in its knowledge or view of God's glory and beauty union with God, conformity and love to him, and joy in him. So this is not obviously the same thing as pleasure. You might think it's obviously not the same thing as pleasure. <laughs> um, you might even think that, well, I mean, because of the last part and joy in him, um, it seems clear that it includes some kind of pleasure, at least. Edwards would probably say, in fact, the highest pleasure, right? The highest pleasure consists in contemplating the most beautiful object. That's an ancient argument, not invented, you know, invented by Plato, not invented by Edwards. Uh, but um, uh, um, you know, so he uh, he's not opposed to pleasure despite being a puritan <laughs> he just might uh, locate in an unusual place whether well unusual from our point of view anyway um whether there's it also includes something that's not pleasure um, um i don't know i don't think he says enough about this to be sure um it's uh In principle, you could imagine someone saying that um, the best way to achieve union with God is for someone to torture you. <laughs> and therefore, benevolence consists in torturing everyone. Um, but um, uh, Edwards doesn't say anything like that. Um, he would say something like that, you know, remember he's responding to Hutchinson and Hume and Locke. He would say something like that. Well, unless he doesn't want us to know. Anyway, he would say something like that if he was trying to push that view. So I take it he's not. So, so this is something like desiring the, you know, um, the highest state that every rational being can reach, um, which among other things, presumably is pleasant, but there might be more to it than that. Now, um, um, 
there's a tricky addition to this. It's crucial um, for Edwards to make any contact with Christianity or ordinary life, I guess, even. I mean, if you left it at this, the definition of virtue is that you're supposed to love all rational beings equally. Right? In what sense equally? Well, what you love is their is their existence. So he says, the more existence they have, the more you love them. So if there's like two of them, you love them twice as much as one. Or if there's one that there's twice as much of, in some sense, <laughs> um, uh, then you love that double one more than a single one. So uh, like how to count that in general is not clear. Um, it, it could be kind of important if we were actually thought we could use this to set up a society or something like that. But um, I mean, he's obviously is mostly interested in saying, and there's one rational being God who there's infinitely more of than anyone else, right? Um, but so, you know, but um, per unit being, or I think actually reality would be a better word for this than being. Um, but being is what he's using. So like per unit being, everyone gets the same love, right? So um, uh, it doesn't matter what you do. Even if you're really nasty, you get the same love as everyone else, unless there's like less of you somehow than other people. But assuming that you're the same kind, you have the same kind of existence they do, then you're gonna get the same love and goodwill as everyone else. Um, so, I mean, you know, this, I guess we consistent with a certain kind of Christianity, right? With a certain interpretation of what Jesus means or something like that. Um, but uh, it's um, not consistent with any tradition of Christianity. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, probably for good reason, like, how long would that last <laughs> if there were a religion like that? Well, I don't know. Hard to say. In any case, um, so Edwards does not want to say that. And though, so he adds this thing about um, the um, secondary object of benevolence, the primary ob object of benevolence. Is I hope I'm not doing too much violence to him by translating intelligent into rational. They're not necessarily equivalent, but I think it's good enough there. Anyway, the primary object of benevolence is being, that is the being of a rational being, ra rational reality or whatever. But the secondary object is virtue. That is, the secondary object is benevolence towards the primary object, <laughs> right? So, I mean, this is a little confusing the way he puts it. I, I think it's actually a good way to put it, but that doesn't mean it's not confusing at first blush. But it's it's a little confusing, but it's actually a pretty simple idea, right? Like if I um want the best for all rational beings and i come across someone else who also wants that then by wishing good for for that person i'm like getting more bang for my buck right because the like whatever they get they're going to use to love everyone else i mean is that true of the knowledge of God or? 
it's probably more true of the knowledge of God than it is about like, like money or something, right? This also is is an argument that's already in Plato, that that uh, Socrates at least implicitly makes in the Mino and in the Apology and other places that you know knowledge is something that I can give you without having any le less of it myself. So like if knowledge is the good, then there's no point in being selfish. On the contrary, if I give some to you, you can teach me back, right? Like, because I can help you learn other things that I don't know. So, um, right. So, um, so like if your um, primary object is that you love all beings, then you're going to especially love the other benevolent, that is, other virtuous beings. You're going to love them more. So this turns out to mean like absolute benevolence, all other things being equal, right? So like if there's two rational beings that there's the same amount of both of them, again, whatever that means, um, then like all other things being equal, they'll get equal love. But if one of them is virtuous and the other is vicious, then the virtuous one's going to get more love. And the vicious one's going to get less to the point where I may wish... Um, evil on it. And it is, remember, Edward's more famous work, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, is about how much evil God wishes on the vicious. <laughs> Infinitely much. <laughs> Right. So that so this little adjustment here actually can be a huge adjustment. Um, however, uh, um, I think it's it's not that important for our purposes because it's it it still doesn't bring in anything particular. Right. What I'm judging them on when I judge whether they're virtuous. If they're virtuous, they'll get this bonus, right? If if I, what I'm judging them is on is their universal benevolence. For example, it shouldn't help them in particular if they're benevolent to me. Right? That's I'm if I'm truly virtuous, I'm not going to give them any bonus for that. If they if they're good to me personally, and again, of course, they could be good to me out of a motive of true virtue. Um, but if they're good to me, so then it would be out of a general motive, and it would be general benevolence, right? I'm just happen to be the rational being who's there, so they you know give me whatever. But uh, but if the principle is particular. For some reason, they want the good for Abe and no one else. So um, I'm not. I I don't give them any reward for that. Um, So um, the key point here then is, and this is why I say that Edwards is already taking up the, the themes that are gonna be important in the rest of the course. Um, so this is on page nine in your text. Um, If any such thing can be supposed as an union of heart to some particular being or number of beings, disposing it to benevolence to a private circle or system of beings, which are but a small part of the whole, not implying a tendency to an union with the great system, and not at all inconsistent with enmity toward being in general, 
This I suppose not to be of the nature of true virtue. Um, so it's actually worse than what I was just saying. For, I was just saying now that a person doesn't get a bonus for having special benevolence to me. But um, um, the reason they don't get a bonus is that that special benevolence to me is not true virtue. It's not true virtue because it's not a cordial union, consent and agreement with all rational beings in general. It's only consent and agreement with me. <laughs> it's a cordial union or an union. <laughs> anyway, it's a cordial union with me um and uh that's not the same as a cordial union with everyone not only that though it can be against it right so they can they might want to make everyone else in the universe miserable in order to make me happy so that would mean that they're an enemy to being in general that their disposition of benevolence to me like um, expressed itself as enmity to being in general. Um, and um, Edwards argues that in chapter two that that has to happen basically. Right. It will always be the case that, you know, I mean, the fact that I'm a finite part of the whole means that I have private interests that don't necessarily coincide with everyone else's. Um, um, metaphysically speaking, that can be, you know, like developed into an uh, explanation of what it means to have a body. Uh, you know, I don't know if Edwards went in that direction. I think that Descartes and Kant and others go, do go in that direction. But in any case, leaving that aside, you know, just from a moral point of view, the fact that I'm not everything means that I have my own private interests that don't line up with everyone else's. Um, uh, and um, so if your principle is to always seek my good, again, the issue is the principle here, right? Like it might in fact be uh, your duty as truly virtuous to always do good to me. That might be how things work out. But if you adopt that as your principle, then in principle, you're committed to doing things that are good for me and bad for everyone else. And so it's not true virtue, true virtue, and moreover, it's against true virtue, right? That is, it's not only without true general virtue, but it's against it. Um, now, I mean, there's one other thing to say about this before I go on to political consequences. Um, and then hopefully also to talking about secondary beauty. Um, yeah, so actually I'll say it quickly. <laughs> um, that, 
Um, remember, last time we made a connection between universality and individuality. Why a race? No, that's just a little bit. Um, This is also kind of a mismatch. Actually, I think after universal in particular, the next thing should be singular. Individual really goes with general and specific. But you know, anyway, so universal, particular, individual, that um, universal benevolence means that uh, um, So if you're universally benevolent and I come along and you're trying to decide um, what and how much good to wish me, um, you can't take into account who I am, like uh, who my ancestors are, uh, you know, what country I'm from, anything like that. Uh, you know, if you if you did, you would be you would be entering in this into this kind of particular virtue, right? Because that it would have to mean that you had particular benevolence or enmity to people who had those particular connections, which is only a finite part of the universal whole. So you can't be taking anything like that into account. But you do take something into account. You take into account how much being I have and how virtuous I am, <laughs> right? Those are the two things that have to be multiplied together, basically. Um, so, um, um, so judging me from a universal point of view, in order to exercise your universal benevolence, means considering me as an individual and disregarding whatever particular associations I happen to have. And, you know, what I was saying before about, I guess I switched which one of us was doing which, but I was saying before about, like, um, not taking into account someone's benevolence to me as opposed to their universal benevolence is really a special case of this, right? Like their benevolence to me is their particular relationship to me. The fact that we belong to a common particular um, relationship of some kind. I have to disregard that. So, you know, like, uh, um, if I'm in Euthyphro's situation, I, I guess I shouldn't assume that everyone's read all the Plato's or anything, but whatever. For those of you who have, like if I'm in Euthyphro's situation, my father, uh, like um, through negligence, causes a hired man who was a murderer anyway to die. Do I take my father to Athens and prosecute him? Or do I say, no, that's not proper for a son to do to a father. So Edwards, and I assume also Socrates, which is important for understanding what happens in that dialogue, says, well, of course, what difference does it make if it's your father? He's a murderer. <laughs> Right. Um, so, uh, um, right. So, in, again, individualism can mean a lot of different things. Um, but in this sense, universal, this kind of universalist morality is also individualist. Every person is going to be judged on their own merits and nothing else. So, 
So if this is true, is there room for um, getting to the more specific worry about America, which doesn't yet exist, but will soon, right? Uh, so um, uh, if this is true, how can there be uh, such a thing as loyalty, patriotism, uh, um, love to a particular country. I mean, you could wish good to a particular country, but only from universal principles. If not, it wouldn't be true virtue. And the particular country is going to want more than that. Right? Like, um, they're not going to. They're not going to want to hear my country. I'm. I uh, stand by my country as long as I agree with it. <laughs> but uh, as soon as I think my country doesn't deserve um, something, I won't give it. So, what does Edwards think about this? Well, you know, um, I don't know what he says about this in other places. I I certainly, you know, I think we would have heard about it if he was an outright explicit anarchist. Um, although, on the other hand, I do know that William Godwin, who's sometimes known as the father of anarchism, um, quotes uh, Edwards very approvingly, <laughs> right? So if he wasn't an anarchist himself, he was certainly an inspiration to it. So like, but he says certain things about it that, sh that, that point directly at this, um, right? So here's one, this is on page 22 in your text. Oops. Even as the setting up another prince as supreme in any kingdom distinct from the lawful sovereign naturally tends to enmity against the lawful sovereign, Oh, sorry, I guess I should have read the beginning. For he that is influenced by private affection, not subordinate to a regard to being in general, sets up its particular or limited object above being in general. And this most naturally tends to enmity against the latter, which is by right the great supreme ruling and absolute sovereign object of our regard, even as the setting up another prince as supreme in any kingdom distinct from the lawful sovereign naturally tends to enmity against the rational. So, I mean, on the surface, this is an analogy. But it seems like it's not only an analogy, but also an example, right? Because, like, uh, there is one lawful sovereign, namely God. Um, and if you set up some other prince, you're meaning any human government, you're doing exactly what he's talking about here in the most important kingdom, you know, what Kant calls the kingdom of ends. Um, And um, in case you think that uh, Edwards isn't thinking of that, um, a consciousness of our having chosen and set up another prince to rule over us and subjected our hearts to him and continuing in such an act must unavoidably excite enmity and fix us in a stated opposition to the Supreme Being. So, right, this sounds like a statement of Christian anarchism. Again, uh, um, I don't think that was Edward's explicit Edward's uh, explicit position, just because uh, if it had been, that would be the first thing you would hear about him, that he was an anarchist. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, I don't see any resources in this book for preventing the conclusion. Right? I mean, if you're truly virtuous, 
you're going to be loyal to uh, any human government exactly as long as it's um, deserves a certain share of your benevolence and no longer. Um, so uh, that means you're deciding for yourself. Again, it's individualism now in another sense. You're gonna you're just you're gonna decide for yourself whether something is the truly virtuous thing to do or not. And if there's a law, a human law that says something else, that's irrelevant. Um, Okay. There's something interesting about interpretation of Samuel, but I'm not going to get into that. All right. <laughs> um, but I do want to read this, um, which shows um, the influence of this on Edwards's uh, actual like reading of history. So this now is from much lot farther along in the book. It's page 61 in your book, in your edition. Here it is in mine on page 88. Focus. When private affections extend themselves to a considerable number, we are ready to look upon them as truly virtuous and accordingly to applaud them highly. Thus it is with respect to a man's love to a large party or a country. For though his private system contains but a small part even of the world of mankind, yet being a considerable number, they, through the contracted limits of his mind and the narrowness of his views, are ready to engross his sight and to seem as if they were all. Hence, among the Romans, love to their country was the highest virtue, though this affection of theirs so much extolled was employed as it were for the destruction of the rest of mankind. Right, so um, this is uh, quite a controversial thing to say about the Roman Empire. I mean, a lot of times I've just been reading something about this, about the, you know, changing views towards imperialism. And people will usually say, well, yeah, in the 18th century, everyone was positive on empire and they thought the Roman Empire was great. Um, so, I mean, that's certainly not true for a, for a number of different reasons, but I mean, it is true, like, especially the early empire when it wasn't really an empire yet, but under the Republic, um, right? It wasn't an empire because there was no emperor, <laughs> but it was what we call an emperor empire. They, they conquered a big part of the world, right? Um, uh, people like Rousseau thought that was amazing, right? That like, that shows the virtue of the Romans that they were able to do that. Edwards is saying, um, uh, um, that was good for the Romans. That's why their particular partial benevolence led them to extol this virtue, but it was bad for everyone else. Um, like presumably he would say the same thing about the British Empire. What would he say about America? Like, would you defend the Housatonic Indians against that? We don't know. <laughs> um, but the thought is there, right? That that um, imperialism is uh, tends to draw our approval because the number involved becomes so great. But that doesn't make it any better. In a way, it makes it worse because it's so very destructive. Okay. Um, there's only 10 minutes left, but I do want to um, at least quickly discuss one other 
well, it's really two other topics, but um, um, these 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 topics are not as obviously related to themes in the rest of the course, but actually I think they are going to come up again in various ways. Um, in any case, they're important to understanding what Edwards is saying. So, um, and basically the question is, well, okay, where does this particular virtue come from? Um, I mean, he already gave one answer in that passage I read, narrowness of views, right? Like just uh, not being able to think of something bigger than the Roman Empire, <laughs> right? So, um, um, so it kind of uh, just is true virtue, but not fully expressed, which nevertheless is enough to make it vicious, right? Is neck to make it opposed to true virtue. Um, but there's, um, in addition to that, there's at least two like positive tendencies that tend to supplant true virtue. Um, and these two positive tendencies are natural. Um, that is natural laws tend to make us uh, um, and to draw us in these two directions. And in both cases, of course, Edward says the intent of the law on God's part was to eventually to draw us to true virtue, or at least to um, um, make things easier for other rational beings so that they could reach true virtue or something like that. But nevertheless, uh, they often if we lack the supernatural grace that would give us true virtue, that we can be led astray, astray by these two natural tendencies. And the first one, which I already mentioned before, is self-love. And the second one is what he calls secondary beauty. So self-love, I. It's actually not as straightforward as it might seem. Um, it's not necessarily that easy to define self-love. Um, but uh, um, Edwards talks about various ways you could define it. Um, but I think, uh, you know, um, roughly speaking, it's pretty easy to see what's going on here. You know, um, so... Uh, of course, this can make me virtuous in the really narrow sense that I'm benevolent toward myself. Uh, Edward says no one usually confuses that with true virtue, except maybe the person themselves, right? Everyone else can see perfectly well that that's not true virtue. Um, um, but, uh, but also, he says, self-love, for example, tends to make me... Uh, love people who love me and hate people who hate me. So it's like a modification or development of self-love that I start loving and hating other people um, because of the way they're related to me. And um, um, from that developed all these things like benevolence towards my family, benevolence towards my friends, benevolence towards my country, right? Part of the source of that is that in loving my friends and my family and my country, I'm loving myself. Um, so, I mean, like I said, it's relatively straightforward. I'm not gonna, I mean, although only relatively, there's there's a lot of interesting stuff there, but I don't have time. But this one is kind of interesting and, and unusual. Um, I don't know if there's a direct equivalent of this, well, in Plato, I guess. Yeah, before I started thinking about, not that Leibniz doesn't also like Plato, but before I started thinking about Edwards and Leibniz, I would think about Edwards and Plato. 
there is a lot of Platonism in Leibniz. Anyway, or Neoplatonism at least. Um, but okay, so secondary beauty. So first of all, this shouldn't be confused with the secondary object of true virtue, right? That's true virtue involves benevolence towards the primary and the secondary object. The, the primary and the second object aren't two different things, right? They're like two different respects considering something with respect to its being merely or considering it with respect to its virtue. So anyway, both of those are part of true virtue. Secondary beauty is another kind of quality or character things can have that cause us to esteem and um, be pleased with them that are not true virtue. And why? Why do they cause us to be pleased and esteem with esteem them and be pleased with them? Well, this is where Edward says it's natural, meaning like it's merely natural. It's the result of a contingent natural law that God established. It could have been different. Right? So so natural is actually less um, I guess. You could say that that primary beauty is kind of like logically beautiful. This is only naturally beautiful. That's not exact. Edwards would say it's it's divine beauty, right? But I, I think it comes to the same thing here, right? So this is something that just happens to please, and so to speak, just happens to please. To it just happens again, not to cause us pleasant sensations, but we happen to take delight in it. Um, and, um, what it is, is a kind of like order, harmony, fittingness, right? So most of the things that we usually call beauty, beauty, like the beauty of, art or nature or like uh, beauty of a human face or something like that. Edwards is going to classify here. Still a popular theory, although it's not clear whether it's correct, but still a popular theory about what makes us think something's beautiful, a kind of symmetry, a kind of fittingness of the parts to each other, or, you know, stuff like that. Um, so, you know, and Edwards says, Although God needn't have made this pleasing, he had a reason to. He made it pleasing because it's a kind of image. This really does sound like Plato. It's a kind of image of the true beauty, right? The true beauty consists in the cordial union of the hearts of all rational beings. The secondary beauty contains consists in some kind of other agreement between um, and it could be even between inanimate things, but it's still, it's like an image of that cordial union. Um, so like when that applies to flowers or to art or um, to personal um, beauty, it's not a, automatically a kind of um, competitor to true virtue. It obviously can, could lead you astray in some way, but it's not like um, a different principle of action. It's just a different principle of being pleased with things, basically, right? Um, but the way it does turn into that is Edward says, well, and this kind of harmony um, or order can apply not only to material things, but also to, for example, societies or relationships between people, generally speaking. Um, so let me switch to the document camera one last time here. Um, this is on page. 30 in your text. Oh, oops, not the right camera. There we go. As when the different members of society have all their appointed office, place, and station, 
according to their several capacities and talents, and everyone keeps his place. This is describing Plato's Republic. Again, it's Plato here. And continues, and Plato does say that the philosophers, philosopher kings kind of paint the Republic as an image of the forms. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, everyone keeps his place and can use his proper business. In this, there is a beauty not of a different kind from the regularity of a beautiful building, et cetera, right? So he's saying, you know, so we tend to approve of an orderly, harmonious, peaceful society where everyone has a place and um, that's suited to them and everyone minds their own business and whatever. We tend to approve of that. We tend to esteem it and delight in it, but not because it's truly virtuous. It's not truly virtuous, or it may, it might be, or it might not be. But even if it is, that's not why we're approving it. We're just approving it because of this order or symmetry or harmony that it has. Um, and similarly, I'm just going to keep this here. This is the next page, thir page 31 in your text. There is a natural agreement, and is this the right thing? Yes. There's a natural agreement and adaptedness of things that have relation one to another, and a harmonious corresponding of one thing with another. He who from his will does evil to others should receive, should receive evil from the will of him or them whose business it is to take care of the injured and to act in their behalf in proportion to the evil of his doings. Right, so retributive justice. Now, I mean, um, Edwards is, oops, again, not against retribution in general, as you would know if you read Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Um, but uh, But he's saying that at least um, a large part of the reason we approve of it um, normally may not be true virtue. Maybe from true virtue, we could approve of the same thing, or maybe not. Maybe it will be done differently. But again, it's the principle that matters, the principle of your will, not the action, right? So um, even if it's the right thing, we're doing it for the wrong reason. We're doing it because, um, because punishment seems to fit the crime, right? Like literally, it seems fitting to the crime. Um, it makes a better picture, so to speak. It makes a, a prettier, more symmetrical picture if the crime is followed by the punishment. So both th this also can lead to particular um, benevolence. Um, because it, like vengeance will seem fitting. Uh, gratitude to your parents, for example, seems fitting for this reason. Gratitude to your parents should be subordinate to universal benevolence, but for this reason, it may seem to take on a life of its own. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm out of time now. Thank you for coming at this weird time, um, and thank you for everyone who's watching the recording, and I will see you tomorrow. <laughs> Bye.